Thank you. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Okay, good. I'll tell you, it's nice to be, ba be back on a university because you can feel the energy. It's not like being at NASA where you go into a room and the energy's all dull and whatever. You come to university, the energy's all high. Okay, I'm interested. How many engineering people? Okay, good. How many life science people? And you guys didn't come down here to, to back me up? I can't, I can't believe it. All right, well, thank you for the introduction. As I said, it's great pleasure to be here. Thanks to the local SEDGE chapter, and thanks to you for coming out on a cold night. At least it seems like a cold night to me. I, I came from Texas, so, uh, but I did my residency in Ohio. And the only thing I remember about it was the winter times almost killed me twice. So uh, you guys are a hearty lot up here. Welcome to Living on Mars, Medical Realities of the Red Planet. Notice the little asterisk there, or any other virtually airless celestial body with no magnetosphere. Okay. So that kind of telegraphs a little bit about my attitude about Mars. I may not be as enthusiastic about it as you are, but we'll talk about the realities of the, of the situation here. I've always been a student of history, so before I start, I want to pay tribute to the man who, in my opinion, and in the opinion of a lot of other people, really started the journey to the modern era we are living now. And that's this guy right here, and it might surprise you. Jules Verne, when you follow the personal histories of the true pioneers of aerospace, and you follow their path of inspiration all the way back to the beginning, more times than not, this is where you end up. This guy is the second most translated author in the world. Uh, during a period, a uh, nine-year period, he pumped out four amazing works of fiction that basically transformed his generation and succeeding generations. And the reason is all exploration starts off in the imagination. So that's what this guy did. Now, I grew up in the space program, so it's always what I wanted to do. Astronomy was my first love, but quite frankly, it was the rescue of Apollo 13 that changed my life. How many people have seen Apollo 13? Everybody, right? How many people have seen The Martian? Oh, excellent. Okay, because I'll talk about The Martian a little, a little bit, too. As you recall, flight director Gene Krantz and his flight control team had to make a lot of decisions. They were basically in charge of the unfolding hours of a catastrophe, and they had to decide to set the constraints for spacecraft consumables, electricity, water, oxygen, make the decision to use the lunar module as a lifeboat. They had to jury rig a contraption to reduce the dangerously elevating levels of carbon dioxide. They had to do that with paper, cardboard, tape, and scissors, which is the only thing that they had on board they had to control the three course correction burns during the trans-Earth trajectory and create space power-up procedures for essentially a dead command module, which not only had never been done, but had never even been simulated. So the crew could jump in the command module at the very last minute and ride it down through the atmosphere of Earth and uh, parachute to safety. Now, the ethos of keeping your cool not freaking out, getting a grasp of the situation no matter how dire, thinking things through, and most importantly, doing the math. Prioritize and sequencing your problems and focusing on one problem at a time, always aware that the solution to one problem can what? Create other problems down the road. And then repeat. So that's how you survive. Now, this is a picture of the real splashdown of Apollo 13. Now, I was about your age when this happened, so I follow this very closely. What you're looking at, I don't know whether my pointer works. Yeah, there's Gene Krantz right there at the flight controller's desk that he was portrayed by Ed Harris in the, in the movie. He's enjoying a victory cigar. This is in the Mission Control Center in Houston. On the big board, you can see the face of James Lovell. He and his crew are safely on the deck of the aircraft carrier Iwo Jima. Um, the Apollo 13 team, including the astronauts, had to deal with truth 
as it was, not how they wanted it to be. That's the point of this whole lecture, to deal with truth as it is and not how you want it to be. Makes a big difference. For their heroic roles, Krantz and his flight control team and the crew all received the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Now I followed this with laser-like focus. I was so excited about this and so amazed by the tenacity, the creativity, and the ingenuity of Krantz and his flight control team, I decided right then when I was about your age, that's something I wanted to do with my life. About 12 years later, after finishing college, graduate school, stint in the military, uh, medical school, residency training in aerospace medicine, after completing a lot of courses in uh, spacecraft systems, like environmental control and life support, guidance, navigation, flight dynamics, and participating in scores of very intense simulations, ascent simulations, orbit, and entry simulations, I was finally granted admission to one of the most exclusive clubs on Earth, and that was Gene Krantz's flight control team. And right there you see a young and invincible flight surgeon at the Surgeon's Console at Mission Control in Houston. Everybody in this front room is an expert in a system. The physician that sits at the surgeon's console is the only one in the room whose expertise is the, is the human system. Everybody here in this room works for the flight director. The, air, the spacecraft commander is in charge of the vehicle, but the flight director is in charge of the mission. In this room, the flight director is God not even the President of the United States can um, do anything against the flight director. Okay, he is the absolute authority. Believe it or not, I, at one time I did look this young. This is a picture of me seated at the surgeon's console. I'm not going to go into this in any detail because I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. But I'm sitting at the surgeon's console. See if I get my cursor going. right there. Um, I've got uh, on the big board, you can see the map. This is taken during a mission. The shuttle is off the east coast of South America. Uh, we've got an astronaut in a spacesuit in, um, in the payload bay up here. This is a fault summary. Uh, I've got uh, data from the environmental control and life support system, event lights which tell me how the spacesuit is configured. I've got a live downlink electrocardiogram right here and I've I'm looking at a plot of metabolic rate as a function of time. Um, and I'm also listening to several loops, several comm loops, uh, to, try to, to try to stay up with things. Uh, this was the first PC in the, uh, in the Mission Control Center. It took me about eight months to make that happen. I know it looks ancient, but at the time, that was the, one of the most modern things around. So as a flight surgeon, I did uh, direct mission support. I took care of the crew and their families. I flew backseat in the T-38, spent some time in the shuttle simulator, especially the entry simulations, because that was the most important thing to us. I did a lot of zero-G, also lunar-G and Mars-G in the famous aircraft known as the Vomit Comet. That's right, Vomit Comet. I did a lot of research on the Vomit Comet, including using myself as a subject. Here I have put a probe through my nose and swallowed it. It's down in my distal esophagus and I'm measuring pH as a function of weightlessness. Notice these two astronaut candidates on either side of me are not impressed with what I'm doing. <laughs> okay. Now, one of the uh, unfortunate but not quite unforeseen things that happened as a result of all this activity was I got older. Okay. But I tried to never lose my edge, and I had a little bit of reputation down there as being a disruptor, which uh, fortunately I've tried to continue. Uh, toward the end of my tenure at NASA, there was a phrase, you've all heard the term going postal? Well, there was a phrase known as going Logan. And going Logan meant you told a particularly brutal version of the, of the truth, okay? So that's what I'm gonna do tonight is tell a particularly brutal version of, of the truth. Now, I, I have two things I want to say before I start telling the brutal version of the truth. Number one, this is a warning. Some of you 
Some of my remarks may border on heresy for many of you. Please don't shoot the messenger, okay? Keep an open mind. And also a caveat. And the caveat is, regardless of what you're going to hear tonight, I am one of the faithful. I have spent my entire career working on humans in space. I believe that the eventual success or failure of our species depends on large part in our getting off the planet in sufficient numbers to create um, uh, self-sufficient and self-replicating thriving human communities in space. I sincerely believe that. It seems to me the decision for our species is pretty plain. Leave the planet or perish. Single planet species don't survive. All right? So from now on, when you hear something that you don't like, please remember that I am one of the faithful. Okay? Because really what has happened is there are a lot of things being said in the blogosphere and the, and the chatosphere that simply is not true related to human adaptation in zero G. I call it a lot of magical thinking. Okay, and you probably know what I'm talking about if you read any of, any of the blogs. Magical thinking even has a definition. It's an irrational belief in the truthiness, which is a term coined by Stephen Colbert, that means the quality of seeming or being felt to be true, even if it's not necessarily true. Okay? That's magical thinking, and I even came up with a formula for it. Magical thinking is ignorance to the power of arrogance. Okay? So when you combine that with a media culture that prizes clicks over credibility, what do you get? Well, you get something like Mars One. Okay? That's magical thinking. Magical thinking has paralleled what I call the rise of the space cadet. So when you hear me use the term space cadet, uh, it's, it's not a laudatory term for, for me. Okay? The space cadet sees space as a blank slate. It's a psychological world for the space cadet. And the space cadet proje projects his or her own reality or personal belief system. These people are driven by ideology rather than evidence. They embrace truthiness and, and magical thinking, and you can know, know them by this sign. When you present them with facts that counterman their belief system, their reaction is hostile, okay? And they see that as a betrayal. They aren't very good when it comes to inconvenient truths. So I'm gonna talk about a few realities tonight, all right? And reality one, I'm gonna use I know this is college, right? But I'm going to use two bad words during the presentation. And so one of my words, you've heard it all before, is space doesn't give a damn about your ideology. It's always trying to kill you. It's trying to kill you fast or it's trying to kill you slow, like the drip, drip, drip of Chinese water torture. But it is always trying to kill you. Now the mantra I used was the mantra I used in mission control. And here was the coin of the realm in mission control. In God we trust, all else bring numbers. Okay, so let's do the numbers. So far, we have had over 270 missions, and I'm talking about worldwide now, not just the United States. I'm talking about the species, the human species. Flown over 540 people, we have almost 130 person years of experience. Believe it or not, and this is really hard for me to believe, 2016 is year 55 of human spaceflight. What's the implication of the evidence? What is the evidence trying to tell us about what we should be doing, where we should be going, and how we should do it? Reality two, humans are almost complete neophytes when it comes to experience on other planetary bodies. It amazes me when I, talk, when I hear people talk about going to the moon and going to Mars like it's old hat. These are the numbers. Six Apollo missions logged 300 hours on the moon, including 81 hours of EVA. Since each Apollo crew to the surface of the moon was a two-person crew, we have 600 surface hours and 162 hours of EVA. The average surface, surface time per Apollo lunar astronaut was only 2.08 days. 
the average surface EVA time per astronaut, 13.5 hours. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that's not a lot of experience. And it's nothing when it comes to an occupational medicine setting. And let's all remember that no human being has been any further from the home planet than Silicon Valley is from Los Angeles in the last 44 years. So let's not get real cocky when we start talking about going back to the moon and going to Mars and setting up bases. That's a little, little cocky based on the experience that we have. So reality three. The biggest cha challenges to interplanetary human spaceflight are flight dynamics, numero uno. Flight dynamics is always constrained by the cold, hard physics of the rocket equation. How many of you know the rocket equation? Okay, I'll bet not very many. So congratulations to those of you who do. We'll talk about it a little later. Second, bioastronautics. You life sciences people, you, in my opinion, have the tall pole in the tent when it comes to interplanetary human spaceflight. Bioastronautics is the psychophysiological realities of human adaptation or the lack thereof to the deep space environment and power. And ladies and gentlemen, in my opinion, take all this with a grain of salt. I know I'm an old guy with the gray hair. Solar energy, solar power won't cut it. Won't cut it. To go anywhere, to do anything, we're going to need a higher power density solution. That power density solution is nuclear fission. And that's one of the reasons I'm here at University of Michigan. When I was asked to come up here, I was excited to do it because I know you guys have the number one nuclear engineering program on the planet. Okay? So I was very excited to, to do that. Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, a almost totally deaf, self-taught school teacher that lived north of Moscow, he was the one that gave us the keys to the cosmos and that is the rocket equation. No matter what technology we invent in the future, that technology is described in this equation. You all should know it. You all should get used to it. Believe it or not, this guy actually published his findings in 1903, the same year as the Wright brothers. He was a visionary genius. He actually derived escape velocity and then told us how you could do it with a liquid-fueled multi-stage rocket. That's an amazing accomplishment. So everyone should know about Tsiolkovsky. Of course, he authored 90 papers, and what do you think happened to it? He was summarily ignored in his time, okay, because he was decades ahead. Now, to give you a little schematic about the draconian physics of the rocket equation, here's the Saturn V moon ship. A schematic of the Saturn V moonship. This thing weighs six and a half million pounds fully fueled on the pad. It's as tall as a 16-story building. When I was about your age, I got within about 50 feet of Apollo 13 when it was on the, on the pad. So I can tell you from firsthand how impressive this is. 12 minutes later, after ignition, less than 5% of it gets into orbit. From there, less than 1.5% leaves Earth orbit to go to the moon. And coming back, this little thing right here, less than 2 tenths of 1%. Now remember, I told you, you got to do the numbers, do the math. For those of you that have the audacity to doubt my veracity, here are the numbers, okay? <laughs> Along with an impeccable reference. Gravity wells do matter. The numbers I just showed you was going from the Earth to, to the Moon. Imagine what the numbers are going to be trying to get to Mars, which has a much higher gravity well. And because gravity wells matter, size does matter too. This is America. Size does matter. Right? What we need, what we need is 130 metric tons, initial mass in LEO. Now, for those closet space cadets that might be in the room. Yeah, I know the space cadets hate the, what they call the Senate launch system. Okay? They hate it with a passion. They think we're going to do it with medium-sized rockets and propellant depots. Ladies and gentlemen, you just saw the numbers. 
Okay? In, in my opinion, their philosophy is, is summarized mostly by this chart. <laughs> <clears throat> Here's some round trip delta v's to some nearby destination. Now, delta v is the change in velocity. Once you get to low Earth orbit, delta velocity times your transit time really tells you the distance to some place and back. So here are some delta v's. Notice, first of all, that it takes less delta v to go to the moons of Mars than it does to go to the lunar surface. It takes almost twice the delta V to go to the Mars surface as it does to go to Deimos. Now Deimos is 99.99% of the way to the Mars surface. And the space cadets say, why would anybody go 99.99% of the way and then stop? Well, there's your reason. There's your reason. Okay? So here's the first thing I'm going to say that you won't like. Remember the caveat? With technology today, a surface mission to Mars is a bridge too far today. Won't always be that way, but it is today. Okay? The brainiacs at JPL, and I use that term with a lot of affection. The geniuses at JPL can't even figure out how to land something heavier than curiosity on the Mars surface. And if they can't do that, then we're not going to be landing a bunch of people and doing Mars bases. Yes? Do you have a rough estimate for what Mars is with some aero capture? What? Well, it, we'll talk about aero capture in just a second because that's, are you a space cadet? Okay. <laughs> because space cadets always say, yeah, but we need to do aero capture. What's the density of the Mars atmosphere compared to Earth density? What percent of Earth density is the Mars atmosphere? Do you know? Well, no, I'm talking about the density of the whole planet. What percent of Earth's atmosphere is the Mars atmosphere? I don't mean quantity, but I mean density. It's almost none. Yeah, it's less than one half of one percent. It's about one half of one percent. It's one one hundred and sixty ninth of Earth's density. It's hard to do an aero capture when you've got a, an atmosphere that thin that's always changing. That's the reason why the United Kingdom Beagle is debris on the surface of Mars, is because they try to do arrow breaking, okay? And you wouldn't want to do, do, do that with humans first off. Yes? Does this account for a return trip, or is this one way? No, this is round trip. Round trip, delta V, okay? All right, now, why am I so hard on the space cadets? I know that's what you're asking yourself. Well, I have a confession to make, okay? I was a teenage space cadet. How many people recognize this? Okay. I was about your age, maybe a little younger than you, when this came out. What is this from? This is one of the publicity stills from 2001. And when I saw this, I fell in love with it. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, look at it. Don't you love it? You got a huge base, Clavius crater on the moon. You got two, not one, but two transports taking off at the same time. You got people doing EVA, obviously routine, because these two guys aren't even turning around to look. It's like they do this every day, okay? I hate to admit this, so apologies to you space cadets. I was one too. And I hate to admit this, but this is one of the images that inspired me to get into the space program. Now let me give you the punchline. 40 years later, there is nothing depicted in this that has withstood the test of reality. Everything that you see here, everything that this image implies, everything that, is, that promises is no longer consistent with what we know about space. Okay, so I was a teenage space cadet. It took me about 25 years to unlearn all the stuff that I had when I was fired up about this, the, the truthiness of it. Okay, now you have your version too, and that's this. Okay, you're about ready to learn the same lessons that we learned. So as an antidote to space cadetism, uh, I helped found the Space Enterprise Institute. And what we're trying to do is to do a lot of analysis based on the numbers. Okay, so at least you have a place to go to to get kind of the real deal based on numbers. Okay, so much for that. Let's talk about some of the showstoppers. There are basically four I'm going to talk about this evening. 
regolith, radiation, hypogravity, and synergistic effects. <clears throat> this is a picture of my friend Gene Cernan. Gene's still alive and well, lives in Houston. This was how he described lunar dust in Apollo 17. Dust was a pain in the you-know-what. We found it everywhere. Coatings, seals, gaskets, filters, switches, windows, lens. It got into our nose, our eyes, and our lungs. He told me personally that they wouldn't have been able to do another EVA because basically the lunar dust, the regolith, had gotten into the joints. And it was so caustic and so grindy that it just it froze all the joints. So he said that you really wouldn't be able to do. But for humans, the deal is, is about 20% of lunar regolith is what we call lunar finds. It is so small that it can go all the way to the, to the uh, alveolus, which is the terminal uh, unit of respiration. It can go all the way down there. This is a scanning electron micrograph of one of the agglutinates. And if you're, if you're a life science person, you realize, look at all the surface there. This has not seen water or air for four billion years. Okay? It's just dying to react with biological tissue, and it does. It does. If that weren't bad enough, all these grains have also been etched by radiation. So you can look at all these bonds in there, almost vi look, visualize them as magic fingers, and they want to react with anything. If that weren't bad enough, now in the plagioclase, and look at the size down here, 100 angstroms, 10 nanometers, You've got elemental iron with a valence of zero. Not the plus two and plus three versions that we're used to seeing on Earth, but a valence of zero. In an aqueous environment like the lung, these nanoparticles will probably be liberated and can get into the bloodstream. If you breathe this in, if, if Earth-based nanoparticles are any guide, these can go up the olfactory nerves of the nose and directly into the brain and bypass the blood-brain barrier altogether. Now how will the human body react to this? We don't know. We don't have a clue. Okay? This is some of the, um, uh, some of the biochemical pathways and the analog here is stone grinder's disease. Stone grinder's disease we know about from the Hawk's Nest Tunnel in the Gauley Mountain in West Virginia. This was built during the Depression. And miners went in there and they ran into a quartz vein. And rather than move the tunnel, they grinded through this quartz grain and generated a lot of fine quartz dust, which they inhaled. And even though they were only exposed to it for uh, maybe four weeks, within six months, hundreds of miners were dead from pulmonary fibrosis. It's one of the worst disasters in occupational medicine history. And we're worried this could be a good analog for this kind of thing. So what we're worried about is where on the toxicity status does lunar regolith reside? Is it like titanium dioxide or is it like quartz? How many people recognize this picture? Okay, Pete Conrad actually set Apollo 12 down within 1,000 feet of Surveyor 3 and then did an EVA and went and harvested some equipment on Surveyor 3 to bring back and, and look at it. When they analyzed it, they f it had been completely scoured by the landing of Apollo 12. When they ran the numbers, they figured out that when something comes down and lands on the moon, it accelerates the find so much that you can actually make them go almost all the way around the planet. Okay, so remember those nice pictures of those things taking off in the background when you're outside EVA? I hate to tell you this, but it ain't gonna happen. Ain't gonna happen. So that's one thing that's off. How about Mars? What do we have to worry about on Mars? Well, there are two things that we're kind of worried about. One is perchlorates, because the Mars soil is about one half to one percent perchlorate, and perchlorate is toxic to human beings. Okay? And the other is hexavalent chromium, which is there in much less concentration, but is a very, very potent carcinogen. Here are some of the medical problems for space flight. I'm not going to go into these to any detail because it's primarily an engineering audience. All I'm trying to tell you is, is there are a lot of things that happen when you put human beings in space. Most things, the body does a kind of a de-adaptation de and then they reach a new set point. But there are a couple things that starts to change and it just keeps getting worse. One of them is radiation, we'll talk about that, and the other is bone density. 
You start to lose bone density immediately upon being in zero G and you continue to lose it. And it's worse than we ever thought it was, not better. This is some of the muscle atrophy in the rat. These are normal rats and these are rats after nine days of microgravity. Not only do you lose muscle mass, you lose muscle alignment. And the mass may come back post-flight, but the alignment doesn't quite all the way come back. So that's another thing we have to, we have to worry about. This, of course, is, the, is a schematic of the femur. I want to point out the, the neck of the femur and also the trochanters. Um, in space, what happens is there, there, there are two kinds of bone. There's, there's cortical bone and trabecular bone. Trabecular bone is in the, in the inside, and this is kind of a cast of trabecular bone. In zero G, this trabecular bone starts to resolve, and it actually disappears, a lot of it. And it doesn't appear to come back very well post-flight. Um, on um, some of the CT scans that have been done, trochanter bone loses about 7 to 20 percent. Uh, femoral neck loses about 16 percent. And we have outliers up to 30 percent. And this is on a six-month ISS flight. This is a huge problem and maybe one of the rate limiting steps. We also have visual changes. About 30% of shuttle astronauts and about 60% of space station astronauts have reported sh uh, changes in visual acuity, some of which does not come back, some of which is permanent. And we've even found some physical changes on MRI post-flight of some of those. Now, for everything that happens, we have a countermeasure for, or for most things. So this crew spends a lot of their time just doing these individual countermeasures to try to go against the de-adaptation in, in zero G. But the dirty little secret is the countermeasures really don't work all that well. They tend to retard the rate of deconditioning, but they don't prevent deconditioning altogether. Some systems are better than others. But these changes in bone density that I talked about is despite the countermeasures that we've instituted. So any of you engineers would consider launching people into space without air? No? No takers? How about food? No? Water? How about gravity? Anymore. Gravity needs to be on the list. Gravity needs to be on the list. Life evolved, complex life evolved on Earth under the constant influence of gravity. Everything changed. The atmosphere changed, the oceans changed, the continents changed, the climate whipsawed back and forth between uh, tropical Earth and snowball Earth. The only thing that never changed was gravity. Now, what do you think the chances of us making a one giant leap into a weightless civilization? Does that make much sense, considering where we came from? So I think we're going to have to take our gravity with us. The question is, what's the gravity prescription? What's the dose? What's the frequency? And what are the side effects? And there will be side effects. What we don't know is, is um, you know, is one six G enough or is one third G enough? Probably isn't, but that's one of the things we need to worry about. There may be some countermeasures such as intermittent artificial gravity. This is the NASA Wiley short arm centrifuge, which uh, you can put a, two crew uh, people in there and it generates one G at the heart, two and a half G's at the feet. And we know from a single bed rest study that this was able to prevent some of the changes in muscle mass and muscle deconditioning. Uh, and that study was done in 2009. This is a schematic of a variable G research facility that might look at whether continuous G at 1.6 G or 1.3 G works or not. But currently there are no plans to do this and I can't quite explain to you why. It seems to me that would be a fairly easy thing to do. Because what happens if one third G doesn't work? What does that mean? Well, that means Mars isn't going to do it. And if Mars isn't going to do it, neither is the moon. So we really would need to go back to square zero. Let's talk about ionizing radiation. Ionizing radiation is really the showstopper. And it's important that you all know about this. Um, ionizing radiation, we talk about galactic cosmic rays, but they're not rays at all, they're actually particles. Okay? Protons mostly, some electrons, but also some of the nuclei of some of the heavier atoms. And so 
Some of the heavy ions can do a lot of damage there on, on the left directly, or they can do indirect damage by interacting with water and creating free radicals. A, um, an iron nuclei can do 700, excuse me, 676 times the damage that a uh, proton can do. Now, it's not the magnetic field that protects us on Earth from space radiation. What is it? It's the atmosphere. Okay, that's a really important point. These particles come screaming down almost at the speed of light. They get down to about 60,000 feet before they run into an air molecule. And they, these particles knock off a proton or a neutron and create a shower of gamma rays. And then the rest of the atmosphere kind of soaks up the spallation, the secondary radiation. So you're, you're going to hear engineers make the comment, you can't protect against GCR. But that's bogus. The Earth's atmosphere does that every day. The Earth's atmosphere gives us a constant, passive, radiation protection equivalent of 1,030 grams per square centimeter. And I want you to memorize that number. 1,030 grams per square centimeter, passive radiation protection from Earth's atmosphere. There is also problems from solar flares and solar storms. That's a secondary cause of radiation. They kind of interact, kind of ebb and flow. Now, why wasn't radiation or solar flares a problem in Apollo? This was the pushback I always got from the engineers at JSC. And then I always showed them this graph, which shows that, yeah, there were a lot of solar flares during Project Apollo, but we lucked out. Okay? Had Apollo 17 been going to the moon in August of 72 rather than December of 72, they would have been hit with a granddaddy flare. If they had been on the lunar surface in their lunar module, radiation protection equivalent, five grams per square centimeter. What's the Earth's atmosphere give you? Pop quiz? 1,030. The lunar lander, five. Five. They probably would not have made it. There are also uh, solar superstorms, the last one of which was in July of 2012. Fortunately, it missed the Earth. Had it been one week earlier, Earth would have been right in the middle. And we'd have still been picking up the pieces for the solar superstorm. There is, a, there is a concept known of risk of exposed induced death, or, or, or the read. And we decided along with the National Council of Radiation Protection that for astronauts, we would accept a 3% increase in cancer, what we call the 3% read. So if you're an astronaut, your career limit depends on your age and on your gender. Young people can take less radiation, older people can take more radiation. Finally, one positive aspect of being older, right? Okay, and it's when you start flying that this, that this takes place. The, the point is, is that between 1989 and 2000, they kept the 3% read, but the amount of radiation need to get to the read was cut by about a half, or in some cases, two thirds. That's not a more conservative standard. It's still a 3% read. What it shows is, is that the radiation research indicated that radiation was a lot more of a problem, biological problem, than we even thought when you compared 2000 and 1989. So here are the numbers. This is the second thing that you're not going to like. Okay, but this is based on numbers. None of these are Logan's numbers. None of them. I'm just telling you a particularly brutal version of the truth. We measured the interplanetary radiation on the Mars Science Laboratory. That was the vehicle that took Curiosity to Mars. So on that 253 day journey, 560 million kilometers, the average, average daily dose of radiation in interplanetary space inside the vehicle was a whopping 1.8 millisieverts a day. That's 180 millirems a day. That's 200 times the average daily dose at sea level on Earth from all sources except medical. And for galactic cosmic rays, it's 2,000 times the GCR every day. So let me give you the statistic that you'll remember. If you're in interplanetary space, every 19.4 hours, you get as much radiation as you do in one year here on Earth. Every 19.4 hours. On the surface of Mars, it's 4.8 days. 
I'll let those numbers seep in just a little bit. What does that mean? Okay, it means this. Are we going to see astronauts on the moon doing routine EVA day after day? If you still think astronauts are going to wake up on the moon, drink their tang, put on their spacesuit, grab their pick and shovel, and go out and do an eight hour EVA five days a week, I have bad news for you. It ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen. What about this? Small pressurized rovers? No, because the medical people finally are wising up and calling small pressurized rovers radiation drug delivery devices. <laughs> okay? Now, a lot of people at NASA don't know what I'm telling you. Okay? A lot of NASA managers, some of the senior decision makers, are not really aware of these facts. These aren't, if this, isn't, this isn't Logan's opinion, these are the numbers. What about this? This any better? Not when your atmosphere only gives you the equivalent of 20 grams per square centimeter radiation shielding. So that's not going to happen either. So here's the punchline. Here's what I want, to, want you to take with you. If human beings ever live on the surface of the moon or Mars, they'll have to live like ants, earthworms, or moles. That's a pretty big constraint, right? So my friend Dan Adamo and I came up with a new radiation protection scale. Instead of talking about grams per square centimeters, we talked about radiation protection equivalent. So on Earth, 100% radiation protection of Earth, it's RP100. At 18,000 feet, it's RP50, because half, half of the atmosphere is above you, half the atmosphere is below you. The so-called fallout shelter on ISS, we've all, heard about, we've all heard about that, right? When you read the NASA PR documents, RP2, okay? The Apollo lander, RP0.5, and the spacesuit, RP0.1. So if we get to the moon and Mars, we're going to have to protect ourselves. We're going to have to generate at least Earth equivalent radiation protection levels. And here's how you would do it. Given the density of lunar regolith, Mars soil, and Deimos, for instance, that's how many meters or feet you have to be underground in order to get RP100. So are we ever going to see this? No. We might see this. What about this? Probably not. And what about this? That sure looks pretty, doesn't it? <laughs> doesn't that look great? Think that's going to happen? Don't think so. So here's the bad news. The bad news is, when you talk about these long duration showstoppers, these words up, up at the top are important. A sortie mission, a quick out and back, no problem. No problem. An outpost like the, like the ISS, you can pretty much do that, although radiation starts to be a problem. When you're talking about a settlement, men, women, and children, you've got a lot of problems. And if you talk about a frontier, men, women, children, multiple generations, a lot of showstoppers. Now, this is both bad news and good news. The bad news is, I'm sorry if I'm deflating some of your ideas about the future. The good news is, ladies and gentlemen, there are a lot of problems for you to solve. <laughs> okay? So here are the implications. The moon and Mars may never be more than sortie destinations. HABs are going to have to be shielded or underground, and repeat EVAs are going to be severely constrained and we need to determine the gravity prescription. So what we need are innovative mission architectures, which encompass hardware and operational aspects, the way a mission is flown, to optimize the efficiency, the flexibility, and the safety. And the chief feature of an innovative, innovative mission architecture is synergy. It makes feasible what otherwise wouldn't be possible. Okay, pop quiz. What's, what's this? That's, well, no, it's not a Mars cycler, but it's the, it's the Mars transit vehicle in the movie The Martian. That's, that's the Hermes. Okay? Now, where is the crew? See where the yellow arrow is? Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you wanted to protect your crew from radiation, would you design a vehicle like this? No. 
you would take the mass of the vehicle and build it around the crew, wouldn't you? To try to give yourself as much protection as possible. This is our notional view of a, of a spacecraft, and of course the crew is in the, in the nose there, but for the radiation protection part of these innovative, innovative architecture elements, the idea is to slow down the radiation clock. Because when you're in space, the radiation clock is moving 200 times the speed that it moves on the surface of the Earth, ticking up to your career radiation limit that automatically gives you a 3% increased chance of dying from cancer from the radiation that you got while you were an astronaut. So the idea, if you're an engineer or a life science person, is to slow the radiation clock. How do you do that? Well, you're going to have to redesign the vehicle. We talked about that. Probably you're going to have to do at least RP-5 in transit and RP-100 at the destination. We've talked about both of those. So the perfect shaped interplanetary human spacecraft is going to look like this. <laughs> Anybody recognize this? This is the Discovery spacecraft from the movie 2001. But the crew is not going to be in the front looking out the windows, right? The crew is going to be in the middle. Now, I grew up in Oklahoma, so I can say this, but here's the Oki version, <laughs> okay, where you might use regolith at your destination to help shield you on the way back. Or you can use water, but you have to use a lot of it if you're going to fully protect your crew, and that really isn't too feasible. And that's the reason why you have to have RP-100 at your destination. So what's the best concept of operations for human inter interplanetary spaceflight? Because remember, remember I'm one of the faithful. I believe that we need to be doing this to protect the species. So I'm not trying to pour cold water on anybody's dreams. I'm just trying to give you a particularly brutal version of reality. It looks like the best concept of operations is forward deployed humans in the loop doing telerobotic exploration, utilizing low latency time techniques from protected habitats. That's probably what we're going to be doing. We already do that in some places here on Earth. Here are some telemining and teleconstruction. We already do that here for mining. This guy in his, at his desk is doing telerobotics for these big mining pieces of equipment. Notice there are no people there. What about telesurgery? We all, we all, now we do routine intercontinental telesurgery. That's very important. If you're an engineer, you need to learn about this technology because we'd probably be using it. So if we're on the moon and we need to mine on the moon, we'll have to do it from a subterranean aspect. And this is courtesy of my friend Greg Baden. And that's what a 3D schematic might look like, doing mining on the moon or maybe even mining on, on Mars. So let's talk about, based on what we've learned, what is the perfect place for humans to get a toehold in space? Well, low delta V, lots of resources, little or no gravity well, at or near Earth gravity for people, plant, and animals, natural radiation protection, and permit large redundant <laughs> ecosystems and serve as a staging area. What does that sound like? No, Earth has a huge gravity well. We talked about that. Asteroids. Yeah. Asteroids. asteroids. Where are the closest asteroids that have a launch window every 2.14 years? Phobos and Deimos. And Deimos sits at the edge of the Mars gravity well. Deimos has a lot of things going for it. Here's a schematic of Deimos. Um, Mars is this direction, it's locked like our moon is, so the same face of Deimos always faces Mars. In my opinion, this is the Mars facing side of Deimos, that's some of the best imagery that we have. This is the most valuable piece of real estate in the solar system right now. Because please understand, uh, a human landing on Mars is inevitable. So I don't want to give you the impression that I don't think it's ever going to happen. I'm just saying it's not the way to start. The way to start is send humans to Deimos, have your protected habitats there. Here's some virtues of Deimos, and I'm not going to go through this uh, one by one, but look at this. Escape velocity from Deimos, a whopping 12.5 miles an hour. <laughs> now remember all the gravity well numbers I showed you earlier? Doesn't this sound good if you're an engineer? Right? 
only 20 kilometers, uh, 20,000 kilometers away from the Mars surface. Round trip light time of 130 milliseconds. Round trip. You can sure do a lot of high fidelity telerobotic exploration of Mars. From Deimos, Mars appears to rotate eastward about a little less than three degrees an hour. So you can have direct line of sight on an asset on Mars for almost two and a half sols before it rotates uh, uh, you know, out of the line of sight. Uh, my friend Dan Adamo and I came up with a um, idea called Aquarius, a reusable water-based interplanetary human spaceflight transport. So go to the Space Enterprise Institute website and read all about it. Um, this vehicle is 54% water by mass at interplanetary departure because we use water for propellant, we use it for consumables, we use it for radiation shielding. And to get Mars capture at the end of your transit, you burn your radiation shield. And then you're only exposed for a couple of days before you actually get to Deimos. Now, I'm sure I don't have to tell people in this audience who this guy is, right? Everybody in SEDS ought to know who Gerard K. O'Neill is. Do you? No? No. Okay, Gerard K. O'Neill was the father of the modern space colony. Okay, that's what started this whole human movement. He was a physicist at Princeton University. He did a publication in 1977 and uh, published a, also published a book called The High Frontier. This is an O'Neill style colony. It's basically a sphere with a bunch of wheel shaped structures that are the agricultural facilities. And this is what it looks like from a size standpoint. Okay, so this, this is the Empire State Building on the right. Um, and uh, that'll give you an idea of the relative size. So if you took something like Deimos and you could do a core in the middle of Deimos and your core size was about a half a kilometer by 15 kilometers, you're pulling out all this mass of Deimos that you can use for resources. And Deimos might be a carbonaceous chondrite asteroid. If it is, if only 1% of that is water, that core has 36.7 billion liters of water in it. Okay? If you're a believer in the O'Neill colonies, and since you don't know about the O'Neill colonies, you guys need to learn about, about that. That's uh, very important. Here's what you could do after you did that core, you could put 11 O'Neill colonies back to back, just like putting beads in a straw, and each one of those colonies housed 10,000 people. 10,000 people. Look at all the radiation protection those people had. You could probably have a gamma ray burst go off at Alpha Centauri and still be safe. I'm exaggerating. I don't know whether that's the case or not. <laughs> You'll have to run the numbers and let, and, and let me know. But the inside of these colonies could be pretty creative. And they rotate to create gravity. Okay? So that's one option we might, we might use. Here's another artist's rendition. Uh, Brian Verstig is the artist. <clears throat> Here's some of his rendition of what the inside of some of these O'Neill colonies might look like. Pretty amazing places. And it might be the perfect place to get a toehold in the, in the solar system. So the art and science of bioengineering is to take what we know about biology, chemistry, physics, and manufacturing to turn this into this. So I'm going to end up by showing you, now I've given you all this pessimism and I can tell you're all depressed because all of a sudden you got real quiet. Okay? Now I'm going to show you that, in my opinion, the most, one of the most optimistic slides in human history. And that's this slide right here. This is history. This is history. We went from the V2 to the Saturn V in 23 years. 23 years was all it took to develop the technology to do this. And remember, at one point in time, escape velocity sounded just as draconian to the engineers as the radiation data now sounds to the life sciences people. We're human beings. We'll figure it out. Okay? But it isn't going to be easy. And you can't deny, you can't be deniers. You can't deny the, the problem. Okay, so 
Here's where we started and here's where, where we will finish. We are human beings in all our crazy, complex craziness. Watch the evening news. It'll tell you how crazy we really are. But we also have a good side. We do these kinds of things because that's what we do. That's what we're capable of. And we have to if we're going to be a survivor. If centuries from now, if we don't make the grade and the aliens come through the planet and they find our footprints on the moon and they find the ruins of our probes around the outer planets, they're going to look at us and they're just going to shrug their shoulders, if they have shoulders. <laughs> and they're going to look at our ruins here on Earth and say, gosh, what a, does, what a, how sad. I mean, these people, this, these creatures obviously had the right stuff. They could have been a contender. But they just didn't rise to the occasion. Okay? We have to solve these problems. We will solve these problems. We have to be real innovative in what we do. And ladies and gentlemen, you are the generation that can do it. The earth is the cradle of mankind, but one cannot live in the cradle forever. Thank you very much. So the Cadre Satellite is a precursor satellite to a future mission called Armada. We're going to have a large constellation of satellites that go up to low Earth orbit and study the atmosphere.